people, my people, thank you for subscribing, following, hitting the notification buttons, doing all the good things. This is the interview with Rod Berry from Amberlane. I feel honored to have interviewed Rod because I just sat back, did all the right nodding, and Rod just gave me a complete lesson on how to get whiskey absolutely perfect. I tried five samples after the interview, and Amber Lane produced five very different whiskies, and I know that there's five more to go, which will be happening in the next week. But this is the interview from Melbourne to Amber Lane. I got to travel there virtually, and so will you. Sit back, be absolutely amazed. The interview comes first, and then there's gonna be the series of tastings, along with Rod imparting his deep knowledge and love for the wisp, wisp bug. Sorry for my Gaelic pronunciation. I speak more Indonesian um, and Spanish than I do Gaelic. But yeah, this guy is just a font of knowledge for whiskey, Amber Lane in particular, how to make the perfect drop, and his uncompromising approach to absolute top quality. He, Rod deals with nothing less than perfection, unless of course he's interviewing me, or I'm interviewing him, and I know that I'm less than perfect. So stay tuned, this is the interview. Be fascinated, it's gonna be a series of tastings following. Thanks for subscribing. Particular order, mainly because I'm peering at my computer screen. You're semi-tropical. Oh, I wouldn't say semi-tropical. We, we're certainly um, temperate, I suppose. We're about uh, maybe five, ten kilometres from the coastline, but we're in a beautiful valley, uh, the Yarramalong Valley, uh, and there's a bit of a microclimate going on there, which is very reminiscent of the climate of the southwest of France, and in particular the Cognac region. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not far from the Hunter Valley, uh, which obviously is a prime grape growing region in New South Wales. And Cognac obviously also is a, a wine growing region. And in their tradition, they have developed a way of aging their eau de vie, which is a distilled wine, for up to 60 years in barrels. And uh, this has been a massive influence on what we're doing at Amber Lane because as a mainland Australian whiskey producer, you know, climate is a big issue. Uh, in fact, I heard someone recently make the comment that they would never uh, try or enjoy a whiskey that was made um, anywhere north of Tasmania, which is a ridiculous thing to say, um, as distilleries all around mainland Australia are doing great things. But particularly for us, the challenge was there to create whiskey that had complexity achieved through being in the barrel for long periods of time. And mm -hmm. so that we really focused upon doing. So we commenced our operations in 2018. So we're about six years into the journey now. We waited four years until we released our first whiskey in 2022. Uh, and immediately the market reacted positively and could see that there was a bit more complexity and maturity in what we were producing. And now the sorts of whiskies that you'd be buying uh, of Amber Lane are five to six years of age. Uh, and because using larger casks and following a matur maturation tradition that we've learnt from France, um, people are immediately recognising that there is an added complexity and degree of integration in what we're producing that really sets us apart from other people. Because after all, I mean, the proof of a great idea is people steal it. <clears throat> and the French, French have been doing what they've been doing for a couple of centuries now. <clears throat> yep. And judging by the amount of cognac that flies out of France or ships out of France, um, they know what they're doing um, because, well, I mean, I when it comes to making whiskies north of northern Tasmania, <clears throat> sorry, I had this guy said to me about six months ago, oh, Australian whiskies are shit. Mm. And I looked at him and went, well, in that case, you haven't been drinking the same whiskies as what I've been drinking. And I've yet, as of even this moment, I've yet to try yours because I've been very disciplined. In other words, well, I don't that. do it all well because I can't spell it. And so I gave him a bottle, I think, of Chief Sun. I gave him the end of a bottle of Chief Sun, bought him a shot, he dropped it, and next thing he's photographing it because this guy's like 93 years old. And he goes, mm. oh, how much does it cost? And I said, oh, it's north of 100. And he goes, oh, that's a bit expensive. He goes, dude, you're 92 years old. You're going to have grandkids or great-grandkids that can keep you in this stuff. And he went, oh, good point. Um, and you know, the moment he had a shot of the Chief Sun, it's a case of, oh, well, this isn't shit. And I went, yeah. And this is one of Chief Sun's 
cheaper drops. So it's only going to get better. So, yeah. I mean, Brogan's Way has produced a, a whiskey that, um, unfortunately, I didn't get to sample because I gave it away as a Christmas present. But, yeah, there's cheap you know, three or four whis- whiskey distilleries in Melbourne. Um, mm. <clears throat> even my friend Mick from, sorry, <clears throat> If I'm imbued distilleries made of whiskey and um <clears throat> my wife and I were making whiskey sours and they were going down like a back hit having a heart attack. <clears throat> yeah. Well I'm, I'm the wife is, you. by the way. So she she um she knows she's known to drop um a couple of large drink drinks and she's not a big woman. So she's all about five foot nothing and when I said, Oh darling, do you want to try a whiskey sour? She'd had a shocking day. So yeah. in case of just pour a large glass and just mm-hmm. wave the lemon over it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Because yeah. Know, well, one of the questions. I could just speak to, speak to that issue around Australian whiskey and um, the quality of it. I would say that, so I've been a whiskey drinker for about 20 years mm-hmm. and uh, I I started off my journey with the Sherry Bomb styles, the Glen Farkless, Glen Dronic, that sort of style. Um, so very much a Scottish style. Um, and then I joined the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and again, it was really enculturating me into a very Scottish way of understanding whiskey. Um, and I would have said early in my journey that I didn't think Australian whiskey was very good. Um, and certainly, when you're early in the journey and perhaps your financial resource, resources are a bit limited, you might look at an Australian whiskey and wonder why would I buy a five or six year old Australian whiskey for two hundred dollars when I can get perhaps something that's fifteen or twenty years old from Scotland. Um, but I think that uh, over time, um, the quality of Australian whiskey has certainly improved as whiskey producers have understood that we need to use big barrels in Australia. And that's one thing if you're visiting whiskey distilleries around Australia, um, those that use the larger cask format are the ones that I would uh, encourage you to um, try and engage with because that enables a longer maturation process. Uh, generally, if there is uh, less wood to spirit, so the larger the cask, the less spirit to wood contact, the slower the maturation will be. Um, and the other al- element there is that the less oxygen in the barrel, the slower the maturation will be as well. Uh, and so um, if you can follow a distillery that is using big cask format and are looking at ways of keeping those casks full, you will find a much more mature and complex uh, whiskey. So there are some Australian producers who have recognised this. I think Sullivan's Cove, the reason they were so successful uh, so long ago was they just, from the get-go, they were using very large barrels, putting them away in their cool climate. They could put them away for 10 or 15 years without even seeing what was happening in the barrel. And um, and that gave enough time for that spirit to really evolve in the cask and produce something very special. So at Amber Lane, we use 200 to 350 litre barrels, and we find that it produces a much, much better result. Um, and from a pragmatic perspective, it never made sense to me that distilleries would use smaller casks. You'll find some that have barrels as small as 20 litres in size. Mm-hmm. And in order to create those, um, they have had to pay for a cooperage to cut down the barrels from a larger size. And so, you know, you have this ridiculous situation where, you know, perhaps five years ago I could get a 200-litre bourbon cask for $350. If I'd wanted that same cask in a 50-litre format, that that might have cost me twice as much. It might have cost me $700 uh, for a 50-litre cask. So I'm getting a lot less barrel for a lot more money if I go with a smaller cask size. I guess the philosophy was, and this is driven by economics, that um, if it's a smaller cask, it will, it will age more rapidly because of more oak contact, more uh, contact with with um, with the air, and therefore I'll be able to put it out to market sooner and get a cash cash flow for my business. But doesn't this um, mean that you've got a bigger chance of it being screwed up because of the contact by, with the oxygen? I mean, sorry, <clears throat> doesn't doesn't this mean that you've got a bigger chance of, of your whiskey actually going sideways because of the contact with the oxygen and the fact that a heat a smaller barrel is going to heat up and cool down far more often than yeah. a big barrel. There's not the thermal retention in a 20 litre barrel that there will be in a 300 litre barrel. That would tend to be an inherent risk. Yeah, you're cutting down your costs, but if you've got the same volume in small barrels as what you have in two large ones, 
you've got a bigger chance of actually screwing up your entire production line because you're introducing far more temp environmental variables. I mean, my wife's a chemistry teacher, so she'll be able to talk to you about the interaction of esters and alcohols and agings until you're blue in the face, let alone her. Um, yeah. I just don't go there. I just sit there and go, this is fantastic. This is delicious. Um, yeah. Please give me another large one. Um, on yeah. the simple yeah. end of the equation. Definitely what you're saying is, is true and that, um, you know, pe people talk about sometimes a cask can go from being bang on and then over the summer months it can just overcook. It just it goes too far uh, and it's very hard to come back from that. And so a smaller cask, it, um, it, it's like everything's in fast forward. A larger cask, it's a much more relaxed, sedate pace and um, you don't need to make snap decisions. Um, and the other thing that you can do is if you follow the tradition that we do, which is we don't just vat things together, so dump three or four casks and bottle it straight away. If you're wanting to do the more mature thing and, and integrate the flavours properly, um, you'll put you'll you'll vat the spirit and then you'll put it back in the barrels for integration over a longer period of time. Um, and so if you've got a larger barrel which is a bit older and, and more inert, and that, that's something I'll talk about in a minute, um, you'll find that you'll get a much better result in the long run uh, and you can afford, you have time and space to breathe for the spirit to end up where it needs to be. You can also actually resuscitate spirit that has gone a bit too far. So there have been a few occasions where the Amberlane whiskey has probably been in one barrel too long or perhaps the barrel itself was a bit more active than we expected we've been able to introduce it to other spirit from other casks, which is a bit younger, uh, and then put it into a relatively inert cask for six or 12 months and find that those flavors come together beautifully and you can really rejuvenate that spirit. So there's a lot of fun that you can have with large barrels. Um, and I don't really understand why some distilleries will use a barrel only once. Uh, that seems to be a common philosophy. Um, they're very reluctant to have a second fill because it will take so much time uh, to be ready. But, you know, from our perspective, those second and third fill casks are perhaps even more interesting to us because we can have even longer uh, maturation with those. Um, and we're certainly pushing on the idea that we want to get to 15 to 20 years age whiskey, which would be a really an exciting thing for mainland Australia to produce something like that. Obviously, I have to be very patient about this. I can't hurry the process, but um, using those bigger barrels, we want to hang on to those. They are like gold to us because they will create very lovely, relaxed, mellow whiskies over long periods of time. Is it because, forgive my, my understanding, um, my lack of understanding, because as you can see over my shoulder, I am mostly a gin drinker. This is mm. my longest foray into whiskies. In fact, I think it's the most whiskey bottles I've ever had in my house at one point in time. Um, mm. Is it because that you've already got spirit in the wood and that would interact with the spirit that you, you put into the barrel, that there's more of a chemistry because you've already got this aged spirit in, in the oak itself and that's going to combine and interact with what the new whiskey you've, you've put in? Is that part of the reason why you're happy to... Like if you've had a whiskey sitting in for five years and people mm -hmm. go, oh, you've got to go and turn that into firewood and you turn and say, no, 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 look, um, I'm, part of my base I'm starting out with is a five-year-old whiskey and I can, and we know that a 10-year-old whiskey is frequently better than a five-year-old whiskey. So if you're already part of the way to a five-year-old whiskey and you're making a 10-year-old whiskey, does that, does that play a part? Do actually the chemistry help a lot? Yeah, so the first thing I wanted to say about that is that we did some experiments at the beginning to work out how much spirit is actually in the barrel when we buy it. And so we get all of our bourbon barrels from Heaven Hill in Kentucky and they weigh, you have to weigh the barrel before you fill it with new make. And on average, they weigh between 50 and 55 kilos. Uh, and so as an experiment, we uh, obtained a virgin oak barrel from the cooperage which supplies Heaven Hill and weighed that uh, and it was 40 kilos. Uh, and so what we established through that simple exercise was that the barrels that we get from Heaven Hill have between 10 and 15 kilograms of bourbon soaked into the staves of the cask. And so we try and fill those barrels with warm new make, so freshly made new make, and that will have that lovely effect of drawing the flavours and colour 
from the cask. And so instantly, as you as you say, um, you know, if it's if it's ten year old bourbon that's in that in that barrel, you're introducing to the new make some spirit that's maybe ten years old already, and that's at the commencement of the process. And so it's a pretty exciting thing. Now with our sherry casks, we have obtained those all the way from Jerez de la Frontera which is the sherry triangle in the south of Spain, the real deal. And these sherry casks are 30 to 60 years old. And so when I put my new make into a 60 year old sherry cask, I'm introducing 60 year old sherry to my new make. Uh, and so there is a sense of age and uh, majesty about the spirit that that is created by that introduction of those two uh, those two sources. So, making whiskey is not just about putting my new make in a barrel and the interaction between my new make and the oak. Uh, it's very much an interaction with what preceded uh, that in that cask, what what came before, and almost all whiskey, of course, um, which comes under the heading of malt whiskey is aged in seasoned barrels which have held something else. I think uh, one of the most interesting casks that we enjoy using is a pera. A pera, of course, is Australian sherry. We call it a pera because the laws changed in 2010 and for it to be called sherry, it had to be made in the sherry region, the Jerez region that I referred to earlier. And so some boffin came up with the idea of shortening the word aperitif to a pera, and that's where the word comes from. But a pera, when made in Australia, the winemakers will use French oak and they use those barrels to age a number of vintages of white wine. They will then use the same barrel to mature red wine for a number of vintages. And then thirdly, they will introduce fortifieds to that cask, in this case, a pera. And so when I then put my Amberlane you make into there, I've got... Um, it, it's almost like a cross section, like a, uh, a, a like a geological dig or something. Mm. I've got all these layers of flavours from fifteen or twenty years of barrel usage, introducing to my new make, and so <laughs> on. It's amazing. It's the Sierra Lee of, um, of 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 whiskies. It's the layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, as and things just you've got magic happening, obviously. Um, Absolutely. A lot of it, a lot of it depends, of course, on the whether the flavours from that cask work together. So um, there are some Apera casks that we use that are better than others, and that is simply a reflection of the fact that the flavour profiles of the various vintages that have been in that barrel over the fifteen or twenty years work well together, and sometimes they don't work as well together, um, and for that we've developed a style where it starts in the apera and then we move it into the Spanish sherry cask. So you not only have, you know, 15 or 20 years of vintages uh, from the apera cask, you're then introducing a 30 to 60 year old cask uh, from Spain, a different type of wood, in this case, American oak, which is the preferred option in Spain uh, for reasons I could talk about for hours, but I won't bore you at this stage. Um, and having all of those lovely flavours together produces something special. And we realised that when in 2022, we, uh, end of 2022, we entered our first such release into the World Whiskies Awards, um, our first major international competition. And uh, to our amazement, it was um, the category winner, the best small batch Australian whisky. World Whiskey Magazine rated it as the best Australian whiskey under the age of 12 years. I was able to take a sample to Jerez to um, a meeting with Jan Pettersson, who is the owner of Fernando de Castilla, from where we get our barrels. And uh, that day that I visited him, he happened to be in the company of his good friend Eduardo, who he introduced to me as Spain's greatest winemaker. Uh, and uh, we, we sat down together and we tried Amber Lane Spirit Aged in the Fernando de Castilla, de Castilla uh, PX cask and they were blown away. And th th like these are guys that don't, you know, they don't um, mince their words and they were fairly critical about some other things that they were tasting and then they tried the Amber Lane and they were very happy. So I, I, I know that we're doing something very special with our whiskey and moving through from Apera 
to PX, and we also love Oloroso, another sherry style from Spain, um, produces some incredibly complex whiskey. I'm not entirely certain that this is not industrial espionage because what you're doing is you're st stealing this. I mean, they, they produce something that we know works because the whole world drinks it by the, by the litre. So you're actually mm. stealing the essence of, of what their success and then transferring it to your success. So that, that sounds almost like industrial espionage to me. You're, you're, you're hijacking um, the, the spirits and that the world knows is delicious and then saying, oh, but by the way, we're doing the Japanese thing. We've got a great idea and we're just going to tweak it into something that much more beautiful or that much more sleek or that much more effective. And I mean, like I said before, is it, if it works, for God's sake, steal it. Um, I did an international relations master's and someone was crapping on about American democracy. And I said, look, if it was such a great idea, the whole world would, would be stealing it. They wouldn't be needing to invade Iraq or Afghanistan to impose it. If it's a great idea, we go out and we steal it. We, you know, we hijack it. We borrow it permanently. I'm just, trust me, I'm going to give it back. So that's what mm -hmm. it seems you're doing with your barrels is you're, you've got this wonderful chemistry that the world knows works. And you're yep. to your wonderful chemistry, and surprise, surprise, you rock up at awards and people go, oh, shit, here's the Australians again. <laughs> well, hopefully they're beginning to say that. I'm not sure about that. But, um, yeah, so, the, look, traditionally whiskey was aged in sherry casks, and a bit of a background to that. You know, 100 years ago, um, there was 100 times as much sherry consumed in the world. It was the, it was the beverage of choice. Uh, I mean, I know. I remember my grandmother used to get through her uh, McWilliams uh, flagons with with concerning regularity. Um, it's certainly not something that that our, our perhaps your and my generation are as familiar with. Um, I think perhaps there might be a little bit of resurgence of, of sherry. But um, back in a uh, hundred years ago, it was massively popular, uh, and ninety percent of the sherry was actually um, purchased by the English. And so they would transport the sherry in the barrels from Hereth to London. And then um, the, the companies in, in London would bottle the sherry there. And then those barrels would end up being grabbed uh, by the um, whiskey producers of Scotland. So it was this sort of really interesting process sherry to London and then barrels to Scotland for aging whiskey. So a traditional whiskey from Scotland a hundred years ago would be a sherry cask style, like the Glen Farkless, the Glen Dronach. And you, you look at many of these uh, Scottish distilleries and, you know, you'll find on their bottle um, the year that they started production. So, for example, I think Glen Farkless is, you know, 19, uh, 1836 or something like that. So they have a long tradition and it's sherry cask style. With the demise of the sherry industry, um, there's also been the rise of bourbon and uh, nowadays 95 percent of whiskey and when i say whiskey i mean malt whiskey is aged in barrels that previously held bourbon and there's a very really obvious reason for that that is that by definition bourbon must be aged in a virgin oak cask so it can only be used once and because of the very hot conditions in kentucky where bourbon is made um, they they it'll mature very quickly. So it might be a six, a four or six year old barrel that's discarded by them, and then the malt whiskey industry grabs those barrels, and as we are doing at Amber Lane, we put our new make in there. So um, that's the nature of, of whiskey production. There is a small gel distilleries, and we're one of them, which is also experimenting with using virgin oak, and traditionally. Um, because malt whiskey is made from barley and barley is a more gentle flavor than corn which is what is used to make bourbon traditionally the the, the received wisdom has been you need to use you know um, casks that have already been used for other purposes they've been seasoned so you don't get such an intense infusion of the oak and the tannin etc you want something a bit more relaxed so that's that's been the received wisdom about uh, whiskey. But um, part of my research in the cognac tradition, I've spent time, got to know some of the cognac producers in France. Um, I discovered that something like 20% of eau de vie in the cognac tradition is firstly put into virgin French oak. And that gives a lovely infusion of spice 
and oil from the cask. So a virgin oak cask has an oil in it that you don't get with an older cask. And so the mouthfeel will be considerably improved if there is some virgin oak influence. So at Amberlane, we are developing some lines of whiskey that have virgin oak influence. They're not, they don't stay in virgin oak forever, but they certainly have a kickstart with some virgin oak in the cognac tradition. We have styles that are both French oak and American oak.